You have seen pictures of crowds in Chinese cities with masks over their faces. The smog of rapid industrialization is thick, but Chinese authorities are working overtime to clear the air. But will air pollution get better or worse in a hotter world? Could cleaner air actually heat the planet? It's difficult to get the latest on the situation in China, but we have reached one of the best young scientists working on it. Dr. Yang Yang Shu was educated in Beijing. He came to America to study with the legendary Ram Ramanathan at the Scripps Institution in San Diego. Now Yang Yang is an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. He has already published thirty papers, with more in the works. Yang Yang Shu, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. I want to begin by saying this discussion is not against China. I mean, air pollution is a problem well known in many countries, and Chinese authorities, as I say, are struggling to resolve it quickly without damaging the economy. And this science is part of that. So let's start with some basics. We know what the global average for carbon dioxide pollution is in any year. Is there a similar global count for aerosols, or is that pollution so regional? That a global number is not helpful. You are actually very right on this. CO two measurement is、uh, easier to take because CO two has a much longer lifetime. So any places, if you take measurement of CO two concentration, it won't be very different. But the aerosol is exactly the different. It has much shorter lifetime. So region to region, the concentration can vary by many orders of magnitudes. So you have to be taking very local measurement to get accurate numbers. There has been a lot of effort into this, especially in developing countries such as China and India, to build intensive network of air pollution measurement, both for particular matters,、uh, the hazy picture you have pointed out, and also the gas components. We have much better understanding of this problem than five or ten years ago. On this program, we had an expert tell us that some of the snow melt in Colorado was happening earlier because of soot that was arriving from Asia. Can it really travel that far? Oh yeah. When I say the shorter lifetime, I really mean five to ten days. So if there is a right storm track system during that time frame, it can well carry. As well as the dust emission from Asian desert all the way across Pacific and into Western、uh, United States and、uh, also Canada. So that has been documented in many studies from satellite images, and also we can use numerical models to tease out the、uh, exact pathway of those transport. And the downstream effect to the mountain snow melting is, of course, less clear, but there are also Emerging evidence suggesting when those suits get、uh, deposited over bright snow, remember suits are very black. So once they get removal removed from the atmosphere and deposited over snow, it will、uh, darken the snow surface and、uh, make the snow melting faster and earlier in the season. And I have published papers on this problem, but for Himalaya regions, which is More prone to local air pollution issues from both South Asia and East Asia portion, and we have well documented the long-term snow retreating trend in the last 30 to 50 years is partially coming from greenhouse gas warming globally, but also from the regional air pollution issues, and the relative contribution is almost the same. Now, in a series of papers, you and your colleagues have investigated the behavior of air pollution in a warming world, and some of what you found is not what I expected. Could you describe those relationships between a hotter planet and the smog that we produce? Yeah, there are two issues here, which is wrapped into the problem of the interaction of global warming and the air pollution. By interaction, I mean Air pollution can、uh, lead to less or more global warming, and the second half of this problem is global warming can also intensify or、uh, reduce air pollution. So let me explain the first part 
we have all known the dominant cause of the global warming is from greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, those chimneys producing greenhouse gas are also emitting air pollution, such as particles. And most of the particles are reflecting solar radiation back to the space and therefore cooling the planet. So those are exactly offsetting the global warming effect. But of course, overall, global greenhouse gas warming is larger. That's why we have observed long-term warming trend in the past century. But the problem is we could have experienced much more warming if we have not produced air pollution problem along the way, which means part of the global warming has been temporarily masked by air pollution from certain countries. But looking into the future, that trend will be well reversed uh, due to the issues you have uh, touched on, the health concerns, the visibility uh, concerns in those regions, and uh, the countries are taking fast actions to solve those issues. So if the air pollution problem will be quickly resolved in the next 20 or 30 years, that will contribute to a net warming instead of a cooling in the past. And that net warming will add on to any additional greenhouse gas warming. So that will bring us a much difficult problem to deal with in terms of adapting to climate change problem at the local scales. So that's the first part. Uh, I can explain more on the second part, but if you have questions about the first half, I can uh, further elaborate. No, I think that we have talked about that on the program, how global dimming, as it were, uh, can cool the planet, and we could be in trouble if we actually clean up all the air. We could go, I've heard figures from half a degree to 0.7 degrees warmer if the air was actually clean, and we'll talk more about that as we go along, but I am interested in the second part. For example, in January 2019, you co-authored a paper predicting worse pollution for East China due to increased greenhouse gases. So I'm left with the question, how can haze get worse even as the government tries to clean the air up? Yes, let me explain on that. This is a trickier question, actually a very concerning one, uh, in my personal opinion, which is global warming can actually make air pollution issues worse by itself. So we all know the uh, air pollution issue is coming from large emission, dirty emission, but also it's governed by meteorological conditions. Certain meteorological conditions can keep the particle emission longer in the atmosphere and make the concentration higher, which is affecting human health. But certain weather conditions, such as uh, heavy rainfall or stronger wind, those can help removal the uh, air pollution or dispersing air pollution to a different region to help the local uh, air pollution problem. What we have been studied using global climate model is the future global warming, mostly coming from greenhouse gas, will actually make the meteorological condition worse to remove air pollution from the atmosphere. Uh, This meteorological factor is working against local action to cut emission. I'm not saying the local uh, emission is not working. I'm just saying the meteorological condition is doing the opposite to the emission cut, which actually means you need to cut more than you have planned to reach certain, uh, certain air quality goals than what you have expected, because global warming will not help you in this regard. So I'm just going from memory here, but I recall a talk in a, in a video in the early 2000s by Ram Ramanathan, and I believe he said that evaporation of water from pans, a really old way of measuring the amount of sunlight reaching the earth, it showed a decline of about 9% in the amount of sunlight reaching the ground in eastern China. Does that match up with later research that you've done? The long-term dimming trend due to air pollution will definitely cause a local evaporation reduction. But uh, at the same time, global warming will cause ocean warming and the surface evaporation enhancement. So those two factors are competing. And uh, it's unclear which one will win eventually. But uh, so far from now, 
I have not looked at the observational record over China closely to have the updated numbers. What we have been argued to explain the global warming effect on air pollution is overall the evaporation and the precipitation will increase because of the global warming, but that precipitation increase will mostly concentrate it in certain days, which makes the heavy rainfall heavier. The so-called when it rains, it will it will pour. But we will at the same time have longer days that has no rainfall. So even though the total rainfall will increase, we will have longer days with little uh, or light rainfall days. And those days are exactly the days you will experience more air pollution if the emissions are the same. So that was the mechanism we use to explain our uh, hypothesis that uh, global warming will lead to heavier pollutions. Yang Yang, have we seen a significant reduction in aerosols over China? Do we have measurements to show that this is actually happening? If we look at the China locally, especially the northern China, there has been local measurements showing after 2013, the air pollution uh, level is actually going down. And uh, that is likely due to the local regulation and uh, strong actions on this. If we only see air pollution level going down in one year, maybe that's just due to the year-to-year variability of meteorology. But once we have seen more than five years, a relatively longer trend of decline, people have done model experiment to suggest that cannot be explained by meteorology alone and that has to be due to the local regulations. So in that sense, that has been very encouraging that uh, the local government are doing the right thing and uh, the action is now paying off. But in terms of global warming, that's not a very good news. Remember, the quicker reduction of air pollution will actually lead to more global warming. And those numbers are currently underestimated in even the latest IBCC reports, which are based on the earlier projection for the future. But now newer numbers are showing government are doing a faster and better job in cleaning up the air. So are your research results specific to China, or can we apply these lessons in any country with air pollution, or does the work have to be redone, say, for North America or for Europe? Uh, the general methodology can be easily transferred to any places. I have also done work related to South Asia using similar methodology because it is very unclear whether they will repeat the pathway of development like East Asia or they will take a cleaner pathway. If India is repeating the pathway of East Asia development, then their emission will go up and go down in the future. If they are alternatively taking a clean pathway, then we will actually see quicker warming due to the less pollution over South Asia. For North America and Europe, uh, it's less a problem. Not uh, The hazy, haze problem is not as severe as in Asian countries, but there are also problems at city level. In terms of research tools, people have developed numerical models specifically targeting urban environment using very high-resolution modeling tools so they can provide prescription to local problems. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm your host, Alex Smith. With me is Dr. Yang Yang Shu from Texas A&M University. We are talking about how air pollution changes in a warming world with China, mainly as our case study. Yang Yang, would you talk to us about the relationship between air pollution and extreme rainfall events, say in the past 30 years, and then what is expected in the future? Yes. We had a new study exactly on this topic. This is a very difficult problem because it is very unclear the, about the relationship between aerosol and the extreme rainfall. There are basically 
some competing factors going on. Some people have suggested aerosol will trigger the convective rainfall, which is leading to the most extreme form of precipitation, therefore playing an enhancement in the flooding event. But our study have also suggested aerosol can lead to surface cooling, and that reduce uh, the water vapor evaporation from the ocean, and therefore reduce the tendency to have heavier rainfall. This is a very important question because the public will remember those extreme events, not global mean temperature or even regional mean climatology conditions, and uh, how to predict and uh, attribute the extreme event is an uh, ongoing effort for climate scientists overall. And our contribution here is to suggest the long-term observed record of extreme rainfall trend, which is a very heterogeneous distribution regionally. We have drying in South Asia, the wetting in South China, and the drying in North China. This highly heterogeneous spatial pattern can only explain by the aerosol forcing in the last 30 years, which is fastly increasing. And we cannot explain this spatial pattern if we only look at the global warming simulation or looking at the natural variability itself. Does smog or haze cool the nearby oceans, and is that significant? Yes, that was exactly the mechanism we proposed to explain the long-term rainfall trend. Because of the solar radiation reduction, the air pollution overall will cool the ocean surface and reduce the moisture transport from the ocean into the continent, which is the source of water vapor producing heavy rainfall. This is happening for South Asia as well as East Asia. We recently learned from a German database that China is either building or financing new coal plants in many countries, including in their Belt and Road project. How critical are coal emissions specifically to the overall load of aerosols in the air? Coal emission is a major source of SO2 uh, or sulfate emission for China. So that's a very dirty source of energy. However, we can also see there is an initia going on in energy infrastructure. Even though we have clear evidence of coal emission will lead to air pollution and also health issues, but uh, the energy sectors are keep doing that. Not only in China, there are also recent proposals even in North Europe to build new coal power plant. So that's very uh, depressing. I, I can say that. Yes. Uh, Getting back to the point that you raised about extreme precipitation events, the IPCC released a special report saying that there would be more extreme precipitation events as the world heats up. I was wondering if that extra rain, would it wash out even more pollution or not? Yes, this is getting back to the conversation we had early on about uh, why global warming can actually make air pollution worse. This is a bit uh, counterintuitive because global warming will have more water vapor available and therefore more rainfall. So intuitively, more rainfall will lead to a more effective wet removal and therefore a cleaner atmosphere. But our modeling studies last year have shown the opposite. As I have explained early, the total rainfall increase will mainly occur in certain heavier rainfall days The other days with less rainfall or light rainfall will actually become uh, more frequent. So in those days, air pollution will be very easy to build up in the atmosphere. So if you look at the long-term average, it is exactly the opposite. The rainfall increase overall will actually lead to a smaller efficiency of wet removal and therefore heavier pollution problem. Life is strange. Okay, now, in the winters of 2013, 2015, and 2016, China experienced something like smog storms, we could call it. An industry had to be shut down, car traffic was slashed. How do those air quality emergencies develop, and do you expect them to continue appearing in the future? 
Yeah, if you look at the individual hazy episode, that has to be due to both the emission from the、uh, local sources as well as certain meteorological conditions that are favorable of keeping the pollution locally instead of spreading it out to the、uh, Pacific Ocean. I haven't done any、uh, detailed studies on that, but my speculation is that those events will continue in the next five to ten years, and the longer、uh, beyond that, the local、uh, regulation will pay off, and we will see those events going down. As you know, some parts of the Earth are heating up more than others. For example, the Arctic is warming faster than North America generally, and An Indian expert on radio ecoshock told us India is already 1.5 degrees warmer over most of the country for most of the year. Now, China is a large land mass, and it has several subregions. Is the forecast for heating over China different than global average figures? Yeah, for sure. Global numbers is not、uh, universally true for everywhere, as you mentioned. Certain regions are more sensitive to global warming, such as、uh, polar regions. China overall, the warming numbers so far and、uh, the future projection is not、uh, very different from global numbers because、uh, it's in the mid latitude region and has a large domain. But certain regions in China, such as the the plateau regions in Tibet, is known to be very sensitive to global warming because of the elevation, and this has A lot of downstream effects for river hydrology and fresh water. It would be ironic if humans stop polluting the air with our our sun reflecting sulfates, but then we feel forced to spray more sulfates in the Arctic or in the stratosphere to cool the planet back down. Do you think geoengineering will be necessary? I would see that as a potential option. That we can deploy if that's the only thing we're left. But this will be a emergency option. So far, there only numerical modeling work to demonstrate the efficiency and the potential negative consequence of those of those、uh, so-called geoengineering schemes. There are no large-scale in situ experiment to test out any of this. So, yeah, I would see that as.、Uh, Last resort. Yang Yang Shu, what motivated you as a student to become an atmospheric scientist? Oh, that's a good question. I studied physics when I was an undergraduate student, and、uh, later on, I want to do something more related to the real world and also potentially benefiting the society. That's what motivated me to switch to atmospheric and the climate sciences. And、uh, I'm very happy about that, and I'm I'm working hard daily to pursue that goal. You must be for the number of papers you put out. It's hard to imagine how you have a life. You work so hard. But as we finish up here, is there anything else you would like to tell our listeners? I really appreciate the opportunity to speak through your program to the listeners. I would see without、uh, public support. None of the climate research can be conducted, and also without public support, all the scientific results are not really useful. It has to be through communication to the public, and also the further communication through public. I totally agree. From Texas A and M University, we have been talking with Dr. Yang Yang Shu. He is the lead author in the new paper. Global warming will happen faster than we think. As published in the journal Nature, he is an expert in the relationships between air pollution in China and climate change. Find links to the science in my weekly show blog at ecoshock dot org. Yang Yang, thank you for joining us on Radio Ecoshock. Thank you, Radio Ecoshock.